Hey, David here. We are live back for my Wednesday tour of my library. So uh, next week should complete the tour. So uh, thank God. Been at this uh, quite a while, quite a few uh, episodes, almost 15 episodes. And uh, next week we'll finish with all of my bookshelves. So uh, you will know, see what... Uh, on the plans for after that and uh you know hopefully i'll continue with uh re the regular wednesday stream um possibly moving on to the multiple truth hypothesis or related issues and possibly also continuing with the specific book recommendations over the last two years i've stopped buying books i read books mostly online and i'm organizing my father's library my father has a huge library and my father, you know, through organizing, has given me quite a few books. I'm selling books. And unfortunately, um, books lose value. So books are not the greatest investment because books decrease in value with time. And in fact, they decrease a significant amount of value. But occasional books will go up in value, first editions, or some reason why they're rare and in demand. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of like a car where, you know, right when you drive it, it goes down like 25, 50 percent in value. Uh, also books like right when you buy it and open and use it, it immediately decreases like half its value. And, uh, you know, vast majority of books uh, within a few years are hardly worth anything. It's the nature of uh, the mass printing. OK, so this week, finally getting to. Probably the single most requested topic I get asked about is books on consciousness, um, books on Judaism. So I had a full four weeks of my shelf on books on Judaism. Uh, the Ask the Rabbi, I still hope to do more of those. So thank God I was able to pound out a few of those, the history of the Hasidic movement. Um, but, uh, you know, it's tough doing a regular Ask the Rabbi and uh, you know, my Jewish identity crisis that uh, doesn't appear to be going away soon. So... Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, possibly this Saturday, I'll finish with uh, you know, my Jewish history series of the history of the yeshiva movement and those other Ask the Rabbis that I've talked about for a long time now to uh, other elements. Um, but most of what I want to move forward on is actually in this subject of consciousness-related studies. So I have about three shelves, and I'm going to split it up so next week I will do philosophy and uh, some general theology, spirituality, and other topics. So this week I'm going to do my psychology and linguistics, and uh, you divide it up within a few different areas within my psychology. So uh, you know, my, the main area, and I almost minored in psychology, some of these books go back to when I was an undergraduate at Stony Brook University and were actually uh, textbooks that I had in university. And a lot of these are actually books that I still buy. Although, as said, I switched to reading books online. So I've probably read um, like 100 books in the last year that would go in this section and continue to read even a book or two a day, but mostly online to, to uh, save money and uh, your reduction of uh, space. And also I've switched to more academic uh, you know, literature, which can be more expensive, or uh, your journal entries, uh, PhD thesis, and uh, so on for people who watch Week in Review. So let's jump right in and uh, get to the books. John, thanks for tuning in. So, uh, yeah, let's get to the books, and uh, I will start with some of the big books on consciousness. I have a section I put on like general psychology, um, expertise, um, and consciousness in mind, and then uh, linguistics and, and uh, language in general. And some of these books are books that my father has given me in the last year or so. 
Um, some of these books are old books uh, that I even had as a teenager, and some of these are old university books. So this is a book that uh, my dad gave me recently, um, Merlin Donald, Origins of the Modern Mind, Three Stages in the Evolution of Culture and Cognition. So these are the type of books my dad likes, and uh, I have quite a few books similar to this, which is evolutionary perspective on the origins of mind, culture, psychological foundations. So from this book, he divides it into three uh, general stages of episodic to mimetic culture, mimetic to mythic culture, to external symbolic storage, and theoretic culture. Okay, Tinkle, thanks for tuning in. And uh, you'll see I have quite a few books on these uh, evolutionary conceptions of the evolutionary conception of how consciousness was um, started. KL, uh, that must be uh, visual. No, thank God, David's in uh, good health. So here, Mind and Cognition, a reader, edited by William Lycon, which is a... a compendulum of various topics, starting with uh, the Greeks to uh, modern times uh, from some of the most famous authors on uh, functionalism, um, eliminativism, instrumentalism, folk psychology, qualia, and it has uh, you know, from uh, the big names on the subject, just a, a collection of famous authors. Here, my dad had this book, and... Uh, it's actually uh, um, it might be a first edition even. This book came out in 1976 and I remember this book in my childhood was on uh, the shelf in our you know dining room above the television and I read this in high school. Uh, Julian James, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind which is a conception about the origins of consciousness from an evolutionary perspective and what he calls the voice in the head and possibly the origin of religion and the the concept of prophecy and possibly that some people started evolving a voice in their head that they interpreted the voice in our own head as the voice of god and that became the precipice for religion and then there was a selection factor to uh um everyone possibly having that voice or the origins of the spiritual experience, the origin of religion from what uh, James would call a misunderstanding of our own human mind to be an outward uh, sign of God. There's a lot of interesting um, dynamics of the understanding of what makes up consciousness, how it might have evolved in parts and correlating that to the long form of evolutionary human history. In fact, I remember when I was in uh, Jerusalem, uh, Rabbi David Gottlieb at Or Samek, and I'm mentioning this book to him, and he gave his typical answer that, uh, you know, like, uh, I think, I forget if he said leprechauns or something, some of like T-jumps uh, ponies, but uh, yeah, there might be leprechauns too, but he didn't think there was any evidence for the bicameral mind. But, uh, you know, this is a nice uh, hypothetical understanding, uh, and one of the early ones, you know, 1776, uh, and a lot of it still remains uh, um, popular. I think I even heard Hamarov at this year's Science of Consciousness conference mentioning, mentioning this book and James. So classic book, Julian James, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. My father had this book. He gave it to me recently. And uh, you know, my father was looking at his library and he gave me this uh, um, you know, book that he probably you know, read as a young man. And uh, I had glimpsed that in high school. Um, here, one of the big names in consciousness, uh, Daniel Dennett, Consciousness Explained, Philosophy of Consciousness. Um, and I guess uh, you may be a contemporary of David Chalmers. Uh, Dennett, I think, was actually on Sam Harris uh, last week or uh, recently. He's all over YouTube and events with the philosophy of consciousness. So a nice philosophical breakdown of what consciousness is. 
here is a collection of papers from the Science of Consciousness Conference that includes uh, 2017 Consciousness Became the Universe, Quantum Physics, Cosmology, Neuroscience, and Parallel Universes, and talks about you know, the uh, Penrose-Hamroff hypothesis, uh, some of uh, um, evolutionary understandings, the origins of consciousness, quantum mind, panpsychism, um, and uh, physics, uh, quantum consciousness, uh, causality, uh, paradoxes, uh, parallel universes, a whole bunch of topics, and it's just a collection of scientific papers. This also is um, related to the Science of Consciousness Conference, a huge book, Consciousness and the Universe. The other one was Consciousness Became the Universe, Quantum Physics, Evolution, uh, Brain, and Mind, and it is edited by Hamrov and Penrose, and it's close to, no, it's over a thousand pages, over 1,100 pages on various uh, topics uh, related to the Science of Consciousness Conference, and it's all collection of scientific papers. And one more, I got this book recently. Um, Church of Entropy had sent me a clip about Tim Pool talking about some uh, topic. Um, and this also is, this is a Cambridge, uh, you're probably graduate level textbook for psychology students, private speech, executive function in the development of verbal self-regulation, Winsler, uh, Frainhound and Montero, which private speech referring to the voice in our head. And you know, there's a lot of spiritual conception about consciousness and what is this voice in our head. So uh, in the role it plays in executive functioning and uh, decision making and even verbal self-regulation. Does the voice in our head actually play a part in preparing for what we're going to say? Do we internally verbalize and then through the practice of internal verbalizations choose our words? and uh, various concepts about this private speech, the voice in our head, uh, what it means. So uh, this is a pretty good book, uh, academic. Uh, so let me put these back on the shelf. Big books. I did my those books kind of by size. So whoa, sorry about that. So this book I had bought by Stony Brook and Philosophy of Mind. Um, Beagley and Ludlow, Critical Problems, Contemporary Issues, and it's also a compendium from ancient times to modern times of the philosophy of mind. Bought this when I was a student at Stony Brook. Um, another book I bought, I think I bought this also as a student at Stony Brook, uh, maybe when I was in New York. Um, this is Francis Crick, one of the discoverers of DNA, the astonishing hypothesis, the scientific search for the stole, which is one of the first um, fully materialistic, possibly eliminativistic um, thoughts on consciousness to say that the, um, the soul, the mind is completely produced and determined by the brain. And at the time, there was very little evidence to support the hypothesis. So when Francis Crick wrote this book in 1994, so it's actually a first edition, it was rather new. And I mean, although you know, people going back to, uh, um, 
I forget, Tom Hobbs, I think maybe was one of the first to uh, you know, have a materialistic uh, understanding of the brain that the soul is produced by the brain. This was one of more of the first scientific uh, postulations to fully reduce consciousness to um, biology. Here are actually have a few of these books. My dad used to really like Douglas Hofstetter. So here was a famous book going back to, uh, I remember my dad had this book when I was in high school and I read this book also when I was in high school in the New York, I rebought it. My dad has basically the whole Hofstetter collection. I know at the, you know, just organizing some books in my dad's house, he's got you know, almost a full half a shelf of books by Hofstetter and just trying to get the year on this uh, 1979. So this was a really popular book, Godel Escher Bach, The Eternal uh, Golden Braid, uh, looking for similarities between Gordel, uh, the mathematician, the logician, Escher, the artist, and Bach, um, a metaphorical fugue on minds and machines and the spirit of Lewis Carroll. And it's a little bit poetic. Um, I'm not the biggest Hofstetter fan, but I have quite a few of his books. And this book was uh, relatively a, a big bestseller, Pulitzer Prize winner, very popular in uh, the 80s. My dad really liked this book. There's some interesting uh, conceptions and thoughts on uh, the mind and consciousness and trying to connect uh, interdisciplinary studies. Another, this is Hofstetter and Dennett, The Mind's Eye, Fantasies and Reflections of the Self and Soul. And this has a lot of uh, like literature and uh, compilations, a little bit hard to read. Um, the Mind's Eye, Hofstetter and Dennett. Um, here, I got a few Stephen Pinker books. So Stephen Pinker... Uh, I guess the main disciple of Noam Chomsky. I got it. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so Pinker now the head of uh, uh, the department in Harvard um, that started in linguistics and now is in philosophy of mind, neuroscience, a uh, whole bunch of fields, popular speaker, and author, uh, writer, uh, written, I think, well over 10 books on all sorts of topics, how the mind works. Um, nice overview here psychology press collection motivational and cognitive control so I have a section on expertise um, so I'm actually going to move this book so I'll come back to this one this one's more related to uh, the Topic of expertise. Here's experience versus understanding by uh, Breadmeyer. Just uh, trying to remember this book. Um, understanding your 21st century society, yourself in 21st century society. Um, having to do with concepts of free will. Uh, so this one's a little bit more philosophical. This one's an interesting book. I mentioned a lot of this stuff on Week in Review. I bought this one recently in Oxford. Uh, textbook, Joint Attention, Communication, and Other Minds. And yeah, I've mentioned this quite a bit on Week in Review, the concept of joint attention and what does it mean for two people to concentrate on the same thing at the same time. Uh, there's studies in primates and, uh, um, you know, I've actually mentioned spiritual approaches to it. So there's an expert psychology uh, collections, issues in philosophy and psychology about the best understanding we could have of joint attention and, you know, whatever one mind takes to produce consciousness, what does it mean when two minds are focused on the same thing? And... Another one, 
Jeffrey Schwartz and Begley, The Mind and the Brain, Neuroplasticity and the Power of Mental Force, referring to uh, what we know about material neuronal changes in the brain related to cognition. And a few more, so these are kind of on consciousness mind, which uh, you could be similar words to describe the same phenomenon. Um, so here, Edward O. Wilson, thinking I had uh, um, Daniel from Active Inference who studied uh, ants. So Edward O. Wilson was also an entomologist who studied ants, and this is about the social conquest of Earth referring to the evolution of society uh, with overviews of thought and consciousness. Um, so not necessarily um, completely related to these topics, but included these together. Here's Cognitive Foundations of Natural History Towards an Anthropology of Science by Scott Atran. I think another book from Atran on uh, evolution but uh, you know, another look on the origins connecting of uh, biology and uh, cognition, but more philosophical uh, and talking about the philosophical perspective of systems, thinking in terms of systems and the role that cognition plays in systems thought and uh, approach towards understanding uh, human history. Um, another Scott Atran, the, nat uh, the Native Mind, and the cultural construction of nature and you know, so our mental conception of the external world and nature and natural systems in relation to the evolution of the human mind um yeah i put this together these books uh pinkers better angels of our nature why violence has declined which uh not a direct overview to consciousness, but uh, some overview to uh, um, historical neural consciousness and the uh, uh, evolution of society and mind. Here, Antio Damasio, self comes to mind constructing the conscious brain, which is also somewhat like a neurological understanding uh, latest advancements in neurology and consciousness. The Evolution of the Mind by Richard Townsend. Um, you know, quite a few books on these similar topics of the evolution of the mind. Um, another one from Bacteria to Back and Back by Daniel Dennett, The Evolution of Minds. Uh, very popular topic, as you can see. And here, Jennifer Orlett, Me, Myself, and Why Searching for the Science of Self, which is somewhat autobiographical, but also uh, uh, you look into the current state of neurological understandings of the self. And Dark Ages by Lee McIntyre, Case for the Science of Human Behavior in Relation to Mind. What does it mean, the science of human behavior or what, you know, how could we advance, how do we define and research and make advances in such a uh, concept? Okay, so let's move next into 
expertise. So this is actually one of the fields that I hope to advance research in. I've done quite a bit of research already into it and a lot of my research into the field is meant to allow me to produce uh, more thoughts on the science of expertise. So part of what brings me into the science of expertise is chess playing. And, uh, you know, as a kid, I had known about these intelligence and psychological studies on chess players as I was, uh, uh, you know, call a junior chess prodigy. So here's a recent famous book by Hearst and not blindfold chess history, psychology and techniques, champions, world records, and important games about players who have played the most games of blindfold and early theories about how it was done in relation to intelligence or just simple memory techniques. Duvet actually um, met and spent some time with Timur Gureyev, uh, a current uh, grand chess grandmaster who's the famous for doing the most blindfold games in recent times and doing a, a chess blindfold uh, simuls. And uh, you know, so this is loosely connected to expertise. Here, off the charts, the hidden lives and lessons of American Child Prodigies by Ann Hubbard, just talking about uh, um, child prodigies, um, education. Here, your more academic, the Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert Performance. Um, up to date, I have the more newer edition that's like uh, 2,500 pages. This one's like 800 pages and a lot of sections. Um, it said like originally there was a lot more on chess in more recent times chess has became less popular and a lot of evidence has shown not necessarily the strongest correlation between chess and intelligence however still uh, chess is something that's well defined where there's levels of expertise but a lot of stuff on sports music um, military equipment usage um, medicine um, yeah, I've talked a lot of we can review a lot of standardization and testing. So, you know, the Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert Performance Compendulum. Here, I've covered this a little bit. I have a YouTube stream and I plan on doing more, maybe even a whole stream on Fernet Go Go uh, Gobet of uh, Sweden, Switzerland, I think is an expert now in UK. I'd even thought maybe to try to reach out and try to get an interview with him, uh, although you know, it's tough to know if people aren't necessarily all that friendly. Um, but uh, one of the fathers of chunking theory, a chess international master um, psychologist who's conducted many studies on chess players and is one of the big proponents on chunking theory. So his understanding expertise, a uh, multidisciplinary approach, Fernand Gobet, and uh, you can check my YouTube channel related to chess. I have quite a bit on Gobay, and hopefully we'll turn back to more. And when I eventually, chunking theory is one of the, my uh, pet projects that uh, I will definitely plan on returning to in detail and even have possibly my own unique insights or field that I, I would hope, uh, God willing, to even uh, publish on. So... Uh, Fernand Gobet, Understanding Expertise, the Multidisciplinary Approach. Great book. I read this one twice, actually. I reread it uh, recently. Um, also, one of the big names um, passed away in the last few years, also uh, wrote on chess, although he wasn't uh, an exceptional chess player, Andres Erickson, who was... Um, now, I think my beard might be uneven. So Duvid burnt, Duvid, uh, you know, God forbid, the Hasidic uh, burn, uh, beard burning. So my, if my face looks uneven, it's probably my beard that's uneven. That might be causing uh, a distortion or possibly the light. But uh, no, thank God Duvid's in uh, fine health. No, nothing swollen. So Andres Erickson, um, 
probably one of the most world-renowned experts on expertise. A lot of people call him the father of the 10,000 um, hour rule. And so here's his uh, Compendulum uh, Cambridge uh, development of professional expertise toward measurement and expert performance and design of optimal learning environments. So uh, you're very important uh, related to professional development where, you know, as opposed to like chess and expertise, where you have uh, professional expertise such as uh, licensing for pilots, uh, technicians, uh, uh, professionals, uh, doctors, various fields, how is it tested? Um, how can we delineate levels of expertise and then test them? My dad gave me this book and I was going to sell it, but I saw my dad had it autographed, but you know, it's all autographed to April. Um, so, you know, I saw Yuri Geller was in the newspaper today talking about like the UFOs, uh, possibly like shooting down UFOs. Um, but uh, Kreskin was another like famous uh, mentalist. And so here was Kreskin's Mind Power book, uh, Tools for Developing uh, Special Mind Power Techniques. I believe he's also Jewish. And my dad gave me this book. I was just going to sell it, but I noticed it was autographed, so I read it. I kept it. A little interesting uh, insights, not that necessarily like academic or psychological, but more kind of like the you know, mental magician, uh, mentalist uh, type things, but some general good advice on actualizing the human mind. What I was showing earlier, motivation and cognitive control. Expertise is a lot of times related to motivation. And you say, well, is it natural ability or expertise is directly related to motivation? And uh, you know, what is motivation? Uh, how do you define motivation? What does it mean to be motivated? Can you self-motivate it in terms of the relationship between motivation and expertise? Or here what you call cognitive control in terms if say it's expertise a form of controlling our own mind you know, so i just mentioned kreskin and mind power but this uh he was more academic uh, neurological uh about what science uh neuro psychology knows about motivation and cognitive control um here i have a whole stream on this book this is the famous, uh, one of the most famous psychological studies, Thought and Choice in Chess by Adrian de Groot, which is the origins of chunking theory. And it was studies on chess in memory or thought and choice decision making on various levels of expertise of chess players, which led to, so to say, the discovery of chunking theory and some of the first thoughts on the nature of expertise and how to delineate the difference between levels of performance of various players uh, originally from, I think, 1945, uh, published in English in the 60s, a famous book. I have a whole stream related to this Thought and Choice in Chess by Adrian de Groot, also a strong chess player, strong master, who um, was also a professor of psychology. So here's the famous book by Andres Ericsson, uh, passed away a few years ago. I think also maybe was from Sweden. Peak Secrets from the New Science of Expertise, where Ericsson, uh, you're also the father of the 10,000 hour rule for expertise, um, but also this concept of peak performance. Um, I've read the book. I don't have the book on flow. Uh, and I plan on covering that a little bit more. I forget the author of the name of who wrote on flow uh, but peak andres erickson was one of the your know, world expert uh, researchers on this expertise and what it means for peak performance um what you can we understand of people who in various fields such as athletics um mental performance uh, genius that 
have an output of peak performance that may not be constant, that uh, you know, the people who achieve peak performance may not uh, uh, you know, almost, almost never constantly have peak performance, but uh, have moments of peak performance. So Andre Erickson, one of the fathers of the science of expertise, and this is his more popular book. Um, and also, Child Education, The Smartest Kids in the World, and How They Got That Way About uh, Education Systems in the, in, Around the World and the Production of uh, Top Achieving Kids. And Duvid, alumni of the Roper School in Metro Detroit uh, School for the Talented and Gifted, Anna Marie Roper, uh, blessed memory, a student of Freud, um, escaped uh, Nazi Germany, came to America, established uh, a few different schools, and eventually the Roper School in Metro Detroit, which was a school for the talented and gifted, and uh, you had like 130 IQ uh, minimum and testing and also like a Frankfurt, uh, um, you know, like leftist uh, teaching ideology. Um, but uh, you know, she was one of the first, it, I believe it was the first school in the U.S. specifically for gifted children and even using an IQ test for admissions criteria. And um, so she was a world expert on what we'll call gifted education. So here's just a collection of her selective writing and speeches. And another Anna Marie Roper, The Eye of the Beholder, a guided journey to the essence of a child. So uh, I put it here together with expertise because her um, expertise was in the education of gifted children, uh, high IQ children. Okay, two quick books. Um, I'll look at the chat real quick. So just two quick books that I included in my psychology section. So people uh, watching week, watching Duvid maybe are familiar with Josh Neal from uh, the alt-right who, uh, you know, God forbid, was doxxed and outed uh, in, in New York uh, over the last few years, has returned with the Jefferson Lee Show on Tyler Hamilton and wrote his book on American Extremist, uh, The Psychology of Political Extremism. So Duvid bought this uh, book recently. And another one, not really a psychology book, but I included it with psychology of Among the Thugs, The Experience and Seduction of Crowd Violence, referring to soccer uh, gang warfare in Britain in like the 80s, uh, Bill Bufford, um, a little bit uh, you know, minorly uh, interesting in connection to um, the crowd psychology and violence. Okay, so... These books are, I'll call general psychology. So they're on a whole variety of topics. Um, but I, I put them together as we'll call general psychology. And, uh, you know, some of these books are, are older. So, you know, here, yeah, I bought this book like 20 years ago. Uh, good reference. This is the third edition. Who knows what edition they're on now? The Clinical Handbook of Psychological uh, Disorders, um, common uh, reference book of uh, 
handbook. I think I even tried reading this, you know, straight through. And uh, I forget if it's how many there are in here. But, uh, you know, these, this is a well-known type book. Here is Mortimer Hunt, The Story of Psychology. Interesting uh, long-form history, uh, you know, from ancient times to modern times of the history of psychology, a topic I've went into and hopefully we'll return to with my essay on the uh, science of self, self-formation that I hope to return to. Here, famous book, Classic Studies in Abnormal Psychology, and is just a collection of famous studies and tests in abnormal psychology. And another classic book, uh, 40 Studies That Change Psychology, Experiments in to the history of psychological uh, ex explorations into the history of psychological research by Robert uh, Hack. A lot of these are very interesting, uh, well known that uh, almost everybody uh, would be familiar with these famous experiments that change the way we understand human nature. This I just put together, um, the medical interview, uh, three function approach to uh, how we look at the medical interviews. This is more for doctors, uh, but I didn't really have anywhere great to put it, so I put it with psychology. It's somewhat psychological related. Um, I think I've showed this one before. This is an interesting book about uh, cocaine. Sigmund Freud, William Halstead, and the miracle drug cocaine and anatomy of addiction. It talks about William Halstead, one of the founders of modern surgery, and uh, you know, cocaine is actually uh, anesthetic. Uh, a painkiller like uh, um, is used by dentists that inject people when they, you know, God forbid, do a dental surgery, use something similar to cocaine. And Freud, who experimented with cocaine um, in relation to psychology and was a cocaine addict himself. So uh, interesting history. Here, um, Luke Ford was covering Merve Emre. So uh, I got this book recently. It was pretty interesting. The Personality Brokers, The Strange History of the Myers-Briggs uh, and the Birth of Personality Testing. So just the history of the mother-daughter team of Myers-Briggs and how they created the Myers-Briggs personality test, uh, the relationship to Jung, uh, the correspondence and meetings they had with Jung, to uh, working together with the standards agency and creating the test to the current organization that uh, you know has one of the largest uh, um, for-profit uh, organizations that administers uh, these tests. So uh, it's a pretty good book. Uh, heard about this author through Luke Ford, although he was covering other things than this book. I actually, I think I had the version two. So I had this book. You know, you can see it's pretty beat up. I let a few people borrow it. I had this book in New York, like it's over, uh, over 20 years. Please understand me too. A uh, temperament, character, and intelligent. There's a please understand me one. And it's based off of the Myers-Briggs personality test. Yeah, Tinko Lidocaine. I think that might be what dentists use. Okay, so some of these are pretty old books. These books are actually textbooks when I was in Stony Brook and I had almost minored in psychology. It took quite a few, even 300 level courses in psychology in Stony Brook. Actually, the first course I took at Stony Brook, a summer night class was Music and Memory. And this was the textbook by Bob Snyder in uh, it was a pretty good course, pretty interesting about the nature of memory and specifically the relationship to music and how we remember music. Uh, and here, Human Memory, second edition, Ian Neath and 
Amy Supernat and even had notes. So she so got pages of notes from uh, this, you know, as a course that I took at uh, Stony Brook. And uh, you're pretty interesting, just uh, your full course on human memory and uh, your relation to chunking theory, a topic that I've uh, investigated uh, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, hopefully will produce some scholarship on this was actually written by your friend of mine who was from the band Rock David that Duvid helped uh, you manage and promote uh, years back in New York. And then he went on to get a degree, Israel Batone. And now he's came out with a new book on anti Semitism. So, you know, God forbid he went to university and now works in fighting anti Semitism professionally and just wrote this huge book like the graphical history on anti Semitism. Uh, but he had went to university in his first book was who will remember you a philosophical study in theory of memory and will you know, interesting history of thoughts on memory and more philosophical than psychological uh but you know i, I put together my psychology section i had read How howard gardner so the howard gardner this is intelligence reframed um and on multiple intelligence and you know gardner had frames of mind, the theory of eight intelligence, the Harvard professor. And so this was like years later where he went back and revisited the current status of multiple intelligences. This is when 1999 is multiple intelligences came out in the eighties that I'd read in maybe the nineties that I'd read in high school. Um, my dad gave me this book recently, you know, God forbid my mother, uh, use the sleep machine, have problems with sleep. Uh, I had problems with sleep a large portion of my life. So here, Wide Awake at 3 a.m. by choice or chance, and you kind of science of sleep and techniques for sleep, which uh, sleep is also a little bit of a scientific mystery still. There's still a lot of uh, debate on the purpose of sleep. Here, Veronica Kuznir, Organizational Psychology Collective Works. I think uh, Veronica Kuznir, one of the popular interviewees on my channel, who also was a military historian and a lot of stuff about World War II. So she has a whole series on organizational psychology, just collected essays. I guess she was getting a master's degree. And when I was you know, buying her books, I also got volume one of it, some interesting essays. Depression, Causes and Treatment, Aaron Beck. So this is a little bit more clinical, but a nice overview on neurological mechanisms, um, the history, origins, um, what we understand about depression, and clinical methods to treat it. Here... The Essential Young uh, Selected Writings with an introduction by Anthony Storr. And here, Anthony Snor, Storr, Music and the Mind. And I've mentioned Anthony Storr wrote the famous book on solitude. And I had read Anthony Storr's Solitude when I was in high school by the recommendation of my friend, um, who was kind of like a proto-alt writer in the early 90s or mid nineties. Um, but, uh, he had recommended to me, Anthony snores, um, solitude, which examined great histories, great figures of history, like Leonardo da Vinci, Newton, Kant, um, a lot of scientists, philosophers, artists, and that they spent the majority of their life in solitude and how solitude was necessary for, uh, accomplishment uh, of some of the greatest minds of history. And, you know, Storr's solitude had a big effect on me. I read that book in high school. And, uh, you know, Duvid largely lives in solitude, spends the majority of my time in solitude and in research. And, you know, so I came upon Storr's solitude 
as a youth and recognize that if I wanted to accomplish great things, um, I would probably spend the majority of my life in solitude, uh, which I have. Also, a book I read in high school, I rebought a copy of this, uh, not sure how many years ago, but I'd also read this book in high school. It was popular at the Roper School. Uh, Alice Miller's drama of the gifted child, the search for the true self of some of the psychological difficulties that high IQ children face of the, you know, the double-edged sword of high intellectual ability in children that uh, can lead to severe psychological problems, God forbid. Um, here was the Luke Ford book. Luke Ford was going through this book and talking about this quite a bit. Um, I bought this uh, while Luke Ford was going through it, a pretty good book. I'd almost thought on doing um, a program on this or writing an essay on this, um, Virtually You, The dang dangers, Dangerous Powers of the E-Personality by Eliza's uh, Ab Ab Abujad. So uh, Luke Ford covered this extensively. You could check out his series on it. And uh, you, know, Luke Ford uses the expression all the time, the dangers of the E-personality. And Duvet also uses this expression, the dangers of the E-personality. Another classic book, Vehicles, Experiments in Synthetic Psychology, which starts with a uh, kind of like a thought experiment on the simplest production of the mind going through more complications and then giving its crossover to what that might mean for psychology. Um, here's a few Freud books that Duvid has. Um, I think I bought these at Stony Brook years ago. Sigmund Freud, Leonardo da Vinci, and Memory of His Childhood. Freud's An Outline of Psychoanalysis. Beyond the Pleasure Principle, and Duvid's favorite, Duvid's personal favorite, Freud book, Civilization and Its Discontent, that, uh, you know, Duvid's Discord, I've been having some uh, debates about this, uh, but, uh, you know, Freud might have changed his thought or, or your various, your opinion of Freud's scholars, but in terms of, uh, you know, Freud's contribution, this is Duvid's favorite uh, Freud book, Civilization and Its Discontent, and your know, Prabhupada I showed in my Hindu uh, collection has a book, Civilization and Its Transcendence, which is a, a play on Freud's book with Freud talking about you know, the problems of the id and animalistic nature in producing successful societies where people have a hard time overcoming our essential animalistic uh, nature. Okay, so I actually have a whole bunch of psychology books that I haven't read yet. Or a few that I started to read and repiled to read again in the future. And quite a few of these are ones that my father gave me recently. So I'm going to try to do these by size. So this one I actually bought, and it was kind of expensive, and it was interesting. I started to read it and, and lost my place in it, so I put it back in my to-read pile, The Origins of music uh, in its edited collection of essays and it's mostly psychological 
related, but it goes through all the animal kingdom and kind of evolution of the evolutionary purpose of music, the psychology of music, but more from an evolutionary perspective of where music begins, what its purpose was, how it's uh, evolved and changed uh, over human evolution. Um, my dad gave me this recently, uh, Metamagical Themas, Questing for the Estrance of Mind and Pattern, another Douglas Hofstetter book, uh, you know, from Godel Escher Bach. My dad's a big Douglas Hofstetter fan, has their whole collection. And he's actually got another copy of this, so my dad gave me a copy recently of this. Um, these are also books that my dad gave me recently. So the famous Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, Jeff Gareppi's overview of Gerald Di Jared Diamond was interesting. I watched those. My mother recently read this book. Um, also was talking with her about it. Um, I think I looked, my dad had this book. I mean, this is an old book, so I'm not even sure um, if in high school, no, 1998. But I, I remember this book, you know, sitting on my dad's shelf, and I'd skimmed through it a few times. And then recently my dad gave me a copy um, here also. Um, my dad gave me a copy also. This is Diamond's new book, The World Until Yesterday, What We Can Learn from Traditional Societies. Um, and so you can check out J.F. Greppi's review of Diamond's books. Uh, another one my dad gave me, uh, Far From the Tree, Andrew Solomon, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity. These are all books that I would like to read soon in my to read section. Here, Harold Bloom, Genius, a Mosaic of a Hundred Exemplary Creative Minds. I'm actually going to put this near my bed. A lot of biographies, the type of stuff I like to read before I fall asleep. Um, this book, I may have read. I have a bookmark in it. Um, I bought this one in New York years ago, The Nature of Insight, um, which is a compendium of a MIT Press book, uh, you know, neuropsychology on insight, a you know, very important uh, topic. What is insight? What's the origin of it? Uh, how can it be psychologically, neurologically uh, defined? Um, here, I think, is a Shame and Drum book, a book I bought, I've mentioned in the past, off of Shame and Drum in Ann Arbor when they went out of business. Social media, multimedia, hypermedia, and the social construction of knowledge. Um, so I don't know if I put it in psychology, but maybe philosophy and just what is knowledge, uh, the construction of knowledge in relation to modern social media. So... God willing books I hope to get to. Um, here, Grunbaum Foundations of Psychoanalysis, a Philosophical Critique. So important topic. Um, also a book that I bought years ago and I'd scanned it, but I never really read it. This Hannah Arden's famous book, The Human Condition. I mean, she also has the banality of evil. Um, you know, Hannah Arden with uh, Heidegger and, uh, you know, interesting history. And, uh, you know, so hopefully I'll get to reading this at some time. Um, Another one, University of Chicago. I think I may have read this years ago, but I put it back in my to read Educating Intuition um, on how to train people to be better with intuition. Um, I used to carry this book with me to read, and I started reading the first few chapters like countless times and never actually finished through this Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, what engineer managers need to know about human factors. I used to, God, God forbid, joke, nothing. Engineer managers don't know anything about human factors. You know, most engineering managers are kind of like behaviorist. Um, but, uh, you know, important uh, book. Uh, 
Oliver Sacks, uh, Music Philia, Tales of Music in the Brain. Oliver Sacks, a famous author on uh, you know, various topics related to uh, neuropsychology. Um, another one, Intuition, uh, Knowing Beyond Logic, Insight in a New Way of Living. And this one's actually by Osho, so it's probably more spiritual. But I just had it here with psychology because it's on intuition. Um, but it's actually an Osho, Osho uh, book. Um, Bonk by Mary Roach, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex, which is a look at the role that sex plays in biology and uh, humans and evolution. Um, another type book uh, my dad gave me. These are the type books my dad really loves. Signs of Life, uh, The Language and Meaning of DNA. So this one might be pure biology, uh, but uh, also possibly in the genetic origins of language. And another one my dad gave me, A New History of Life, A Radical New Discovery About the Origins and Evolution of Life on Earth. Um, so these are more straight biology. Um, I had read this book. I put it to read again. Um, Causes and Consequences of Feeling by Berkowitz in uh, Studies in Emotion and Social Interaction, Cambridge University Press. Uh, I think I had bought this book at Stony Brook. And um, Ray Kurzweil, How to Create a Mind, The Secret of Human Thought Revealed. Um, popular book on consciousness. So these are all books in my to-read pile, a handful of them I may have read uh, before years ago, but uh, put in the pile to read again. Okay, so next is linguistics. So when Duvid was at Stony Brook University, State University of New York, I had attempted to um, actually to get a degree. Like I tried physics and I tried psychology, and I tried linguistics. And linguistics was actually what I was closest to getting a degree in. And uh, But I ended up dropping out of Stony Brook, God forbid. I've talked about uh, what happened there uh, on Brundlefly. And um, I was going to get a uh, – it, it, you know, I ended up with a general studies degree from University of Michigan – but at Stony Brook, it was called like a multidisciplinary degree, which I think had like two or three minors. And my minors would have been linguistics, psychology, and maybe physics, um, or maybe it was just two and it would have been linguistics and psychology. And I had almost enough coursework. I took a significant amount of upper level, both linguistics and uh, psychology books, but I, I wasn't able to graduate from Stony Brook and ended up back at University of Michigan. So Duvet has like almost 200 credit hours of coursework uh, from the various times I attempted to go to school. Some of these books go back to Stony Brook and um, your actual university textbooks. So here was a good course. This was really interesting. Um, Writing Systems, A Linguistic Approach by Henry Rogers and is an overview of the various writing systems of the world and alphabets, origins of alphabets. And uh, this was a really good course, a good book. Um, later, I bought, I actually got these at Shame and Drum, University of Michigan, the Cambridge. Um, Ancient Language is of Asia Minor and... Asia and the America, and this is more alphabets. So it's not the link, it's just the alphabets, and it has tens of various alphabets from around the Americas 
Asia, Asia Minor, very interesting books. I've went through these. Um, you know, it's good for the mind to try to understand alphabets. Um, I think I had this for a text at Stony Brook, another uh, Stony Brook course in phonetics in uh, International Phonetic Association, a guide to the international phonetic alphabet. So you have the various writing systems. Um, you know, like, uh, I mean, Chinese are very complicated, but ones that might, you know, phonetic of the acrylic, uh, Roman, um, Korean, Japanese, var various uh, Sanskrit, uh, all, all types of languages that have unique symbols that represent sounds. Uh, but you have the International Phonetic Association that has symbols for all the various sounds that the human can make. And you, if people have seen, there's nice charts. I think I may have covered this on one of my earlier um, public study sessions. Maybe I'll return to a very interesting topic. This was also a course I took at Stony Brook, Historical Linguistics and Introduction. Um, here's the field of historical linguistics. How do you understand and represent the history of language, like, you know, God forbid, the, the great vowel shift, uh, but also in terms of grammar and morphology, how sounds change, um, the, you know, how from the science of linguistics uh, do you determine um, the history of word changes over time or languages changing. And uh, you know, so this was a textbook I had at Stony Brook, a uh, very interesting topic. Um, Here's somewhat psychological English meaning and culture, the connection between culture and the English language by Anne uh, Wernsbeke, an Oxford book, actually very interesting. Um, here, the language complexity guide, MIT press book on um, anaphoria. So this one's pretty mathematical and a little bit about morphology. Um, I have to return to it. This is a pretty complicated book. Um, so here, another one, the origins of grammar, evidence from early language comprehension. So this is talking about language acquisition. This might have also been a Stony Brook text, uh, MIT textbook on, or maybe this was, this is a shame and drum book, sorry. Um, talking about language acquisition and grammar. Uh, language acquisition is also a topic I took quite a few courses in. Here's Noam Chomsky's famous Cartesian linguistics, a chapter in the history of rational thought. So I have a few Chomsky books. Um, you know, I've each seen Chomsky, the, you know, the, the somewhat creator of modern linguistics. Uh, a major topic, I took quite a few courses at, this might have been from Stony Brook, linguistic perspectives on second language acquisition. So your know, language acquisition is a big topic in linguistics, how children acquire language, and then acquisition of a second language. Here, another book by Anne um, Wersbika, I think she's Polish, Emotions Across Language and Culture, Diversity and Universals, Connecting uh, Emotional Concepts uh, to language and culture and the difference in specific languages in relation to emotional and cultural expressions. Uh, her book and that on English were actually exceptional books. Here, Patrick Hogan, Cognitive Science Literature and the Arts, a guide for humanists. 
this book I bought at University of Michigan. It was a recent book, uh, popular uh, Gabriel Weiner, Fluent Forever, How to Learn Any Language Fast and Never Forget It. And his conclusion is that you learn best by remembering songs and poems and committing to memory certain catchy things and then recognizing the words and grammatical structures and the things that you member, memorized and extracting that to others and think that's how children learn or the immersion experience works. So like kind of how Duvid recommends um, learning Hebrew, you know, like chant the Hebrew prayers, come to synagogue, remember some of the Hebrew prayers and songs you like the most, and then you eventually learn what those mean. And then when you hear those words or grammatical uh, morphology in other places, you recognize that. So uh, this was a recent popular book, uh, and you're showing some of the evidence for such a strategy. Here, Andrea Morrow, forward by Noam Chomsky, The Boundaries of Babel, the Brain, and the Enigma of Impossible Languages. And I think you know, Noam Chomsky had that famous sentence about like purple clouds or some purple thoughts or something like that. Um, but you're talking about the structure of difficult or demanding tasks or even nonsensical tasks. And here, Tom Roper, the son of Anna Marie Roper from the Roper School in Metro Detroit, who was, uh, um, I think, at Boston University and studied linguistics, MIT Press book, A Prism of Grammar, the Child Language uh, Illuminates Humanism, talking about uh, you know, the Roper School was a humanistic school, and you hear a connection to humanism and grammar. Um, a few popular book, Language Myths, um, Bauer and Trugwell, um, just going over common language myths. There's a famous book, uh, Ferdinand Saussure, Course in General Linguistics. And I think Saussure, it's kind of like pre Chomskyan uh, linguistics, and you'll think more philosophical, like in the school of Derrida and Herschel, and like the signified and signifier. Um, here's Steven Pinker. I had read in high school The Language Instinct. I don't have my copy of that school, but here's. Um, Pinker's Words and Rules, the Ingredients of Language. Um, another Chomsky book, Language and the Problems of Knowledge. And here, um, a little bit famous in psychology in various fields, Leif Vygotsky, Thought and Language, and the connection between thought and language. Vygotsky is one of the uh, uh, the early theorist on child development and uh, various fields of uh, self-development uh, and actually plan to cover some of his works in uh, future streams. And just a handful more books here on I have these together with my linguistics. Um, I have a few other books on language in general, like a few other languages and the great uh, teaching company. I have all the teaching courses on um, a whole bunch of different languages, French, Spanish, Japanese, Hebrew, uh, Italian. I've at least listened through, but didn't seriously study them. But here's a few you know, random books. Here's um, Using Russian, a guide to contemporary usage. And I tried to study like the little basics of Russian. Russian is a very difficult la language. Uh, coming from English, it's a level three 
difficult, one of the most difficult to learn if you're a native English speaker. Here, Latin, Duva took Latin in high school, took the great courses Latin, and will sometimes review my Latin. So um, Duva's Latin is actually reasonably decent. Um, just a book on hieroglyphs, book of Egyptian hieroglyphs from the British Museum. Um, and Cherokee syllabary on the basics of the Cherokee language. And here's a random dictionary of difficult words. Always good to feed your mind with a new vocabulary. Do his vocabulary is pretty good. So a specific dictionary of um, obscure, difficult words. Here's another similar. My dad recently gave me this, the meaning of Kingo and other extraordinary words from around the world, which are global words from languages around the world that have kind of like unique, special um, meaning. And I have a handful of linguistics books that I still haven't read. And most of these I bought a long time ago. Um, some of these I started. This one I still have, uh, you know, the bookmark in. God forbid a lot of dust. Uh, Jackendorf's Foundation of Language, uh, Brain, Meaning, Grammar, and Evolution. Oxford uh, Press book. This was a Shame and Drum book I bought. Uh, these are probably almost all Shame and Drum. Language Universals and Linguistic Typology. Uh, University of Chicago, another Shame and uh, Drum um, university linguistics textbook, uh, semantics, primes, and universals, uh, Oxford Press, all advanced topics in linguistics that I bought off uh, the Shame and Drum Ann Arbor University of Michigan bookstore that went out of business, uh, symbolic species, um, the coevolution of language in the brain. I'm not sure if my dad gave me this book or where I got this book from. But uh, yeah, interesting book uh, here talking about the coevolution of language in the brain, that looking at possibly the brain is something that language is something external from the brain or the advancement in language happening at the same time with evolution. Interesting. And I think I showed this book here, Arab, Arabic Social Linguistics. I think this was a shame and drum book. Um, you know, related to Middle Eastern culture. So that's actually all of my all of my books. Last week will probably be the conclusion of the tour of my library. So I've enjoyed doing this and uh, you know it's been an interesting intellectual experience for me. People who watch Duvidoff often and follow my research, hopefully this will be interesting for uh, your people, the making of Duvid, the intellectual making of uh, Duvid. So uh, you know, stay tuned for more. Um, yeah, thanks, Gerard and Orfeo. So next week I will do philosophy, theology, spirituality, um, I was thinking about doing a whole stream on Gurdjieff, um, but I'll show some of my Gurdjieff books next week, and uh, you know, mythology, Joseph Campbell, uh, various things, and um, I will do my Ask the Rabbi, hopefully this Saturday, so I might just wrap it up, and you know, so this way it'll upload to Odyssey also, though I hardly have any reach on odyssey i'm not sure like, i mean because duvid's an independent scholar so i mean probably are saying i don't know my jewish stuff probably just due to my identity that people are like oh i can't know my jewish stuff because like i'm a half jew or i do things that people assume like okay i do hinduism so they assume that if i knew my judaism um you know my life would have worked out better or I wouldn't be doing Hinduism or other things, or possibly in preference of 
who they think should be speaking on behalf of Judaism. So they go, Duvid's uh, speaking on behalf of Judaism and saying Duvid doesn't know his Judaism because they would rather hear this other person. But uh, I'm not sure that there's really been too many legitimate complaints about Duvid's level of Jewish scholarship. And I went through the whole, uh, you know, over a thousand books on my shelf. Uh, you know, like Duvid studied in some of the best schools, uh, the biggest rabbis in the world. Um, I finished all of Talmud. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, people talking trash, but, uh, you know, I don't have any official position in Judaism, an independent scholar. Duvid studied Judaism really for my own sake. I wanted to understand how to be a Jew or what it means to be a Jew. Uh, I have no position of leadership in the Jewish community. If I'm a popular YouTube e-personality talking about Judaism, that might be some verification of my independent uh, scholarship, and it might arouse suspicion or, you want to words, their jealousy or competition between other people who speak on behalf of Jews, and then just the basic dissonance of Jews that would be like, okay, well, Duvid's a Hindu or Duvid does these things that are understood to be forbidden or a contradiction to mainstream Jewish strategy. So people will assume that, like, well, if Duvid's doing Hinduism, it's probably because he doesn't understand Judaism because if Duvid really understood his Judaism, why would he be doing Hinduism? Um, but uh, that may have no connection. It could be Duvid understands my Judaism just fine and does Hinduism anyways. Um, but yeah, I would assume that's why uh, you know, uh, people have beef with me. I mean, Duvid's mom is 99.4% uh, uh, DNA Ashkenazic Jew from the famous uh, Bamberger rabbinic family. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, um, sectarianism and dispute within the Jewish community. And you know, say, so if people think what Duvid is doing is bad for the Jewish people, they might as opposed to saying Duvid is bad for the Jews or you know, whatever they might feel Duvid's causing anti-Semitism or something. And as opposed to, because you know, there's a lot of uh, respect in traditional Judaism for scholarship to attack my scholarship. Although relatively, my scholarship is the one thing I'm relatively confident in. You say, is Duvid a good Jew or not? But I say, I'm pretty confident in my scholarship Duvid uh, worked very hard to get into top Orthodox schools. Duvid studied Judaism full-time for almost five years uh, and gave it my all and studied hours of Judaism a day for uh, decades. So, uh, you know, that's the one thing I'm pretty confident in my Judaism is my actual scholarship. And if that's something you could somewhat test, um, you know, so, uh, you know, whatever. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of disputation. There's a lot of problems in society. And, uh, you know, that's why Duva's just streaming, randomly talking about independent scholarship because of all of the disputations. Um, okay, so I guess I'm going to sign off. I'll try to do another Ask the Rabbi if people want to talk more topically. And next week will be the end of the tour of my library. And uh, you know, will see what I do from uh, there on. So appreciate everyone tuning in. So uh, God bless. Have a great night and uh, best wishes. See you the next time. John Wolf, uh, you know, we, we ran out of steam in the mob talk. So, uh, you know, John Wolf, uh, we might return to trying to do some sort of mob talk, but I think we basically ran out of steam. I said everything I knew on the topic. And, uh, you know, so we'll see that might return. But in the meantime, we're taking a little hiatus. Uh, you know, we can review I might also take a, a, a little hiatus from Week in Review, but we'll probably keep on going with Week in Review, but, uh, you know, trying to reassess uh, what I'm doing and, uh, you know, my research and, uh, you know, God forbid, my midlife crisis. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, John's going to have to look and you'll see if uh, it makes sense we could get uh, any guests. If you want to book, uh, you know, high tea, if you want to book Linderman or whatever, I'm happy to do it. I probably doesn't make sense to do it on my own channel. Uh, but uh, you know, we could grow that on John Wolf's channel. So if you book any of those guests, Duvid's happy to come on. Really, I'm happy to talk to anybody. So I would even talk with Lynn Bloom on his own channel if he does that, or if he wants to come in on a guest of uh, John Wolf. I don't follow that 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 much. So uh, 
Uh, but if other people do the work to book it, uh, you know, Duvid's generally willing to talk with anybody. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, God bless Gunner. I was thinking of reaching out to Scott Bernstein because, you know, I went to high school with him. I knew him a little bit. We weren't tight or anything, but, like, I remember him from high school, and, you know, he's local. So uh, I thought to reach out and maybe try to interview Scott Bernstein, but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Just, uh, uh, like, do I re what, what I'd really ask him or be that interesting. But, uh, um, you know, so we'll see. So stay tuned. God bless. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being active in the chat. Yeah, so Duvid may be trying to bring peace between Gunner and Bernstein. You know, it's a shame to see a dispute. Uh, you know, like uh, Aaron Perkyovos uh, bringing peace between man and his fellow man. Duvid always happy to try to bring peace between disputating parties. So God bless everybody. Have a great night.